who can really talk about SADAC. And uh, we are grateful that we managed to get His Excellency because uh, he is very knowledgeable about SADAC and we believe that uh, you're going to benefit and those negative images about SADAC will be cleared today. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for accepting to be part of this lecture. Today's lecture brings uh, together individuals from the government, private sector, civil society, research and academia, as well as uh, students and the media. It is our hope that uh, the knowledge and the information about SADAC shared through this lecture will be disseminated widely through various means to ensure that those who have not been able to participate in today's event also have an opportunity to receive the information and messages emerging out of uh, uh, this uh, public lecture and no, uh, uh, no SADAC. We are grateful that the media is here and the media has been with us since we started uh, this, uh, the preparations for the summit. So please continue doing that great job which you have done so far. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, SADAC, and SADAC as a community has come a long way and achieved success in many fronts and, uh, and uh, along the way has also encountered some challenges. However, there are also many opportunities that remain to be seized through regional cooperation and integration and the positive stories to be uh, heard. This is the topic of our lecture today and I'm, I'm, I'm confident that you're going to benefit out of that topic. I do not intend to go into details of the history of the SADAC, but just remind ourselves that uh, from we, where we came from. The Southern Africa Development Community, SADAC, originated from the Southern African Development Coordination Conference, SADAC, with double C, that was established in Zambia in Lusaka. SADAC with double C was formed to advance the cause of national political liberation of Southern Africa and to reduce dependence specifically on the then upper third era South Africa through effective coordination of utilization of specific characteristics and trends of uh, each country and its resources. SADAC with double C objectives went beyond just reducing dependence to embrace basic development and regional integration. SADAC with double C focus on functional cooperation in key sectors such as transport, energy, agriculture, mining and tourism. SADAC was then transformed that is SADAC with double C, into a legally binding association called SADAC with single C. That was in, 20, in 1982 through the Windhoek Treaty. And they decided to promote deeper economic cooperation integration and the basis for equity and mutual benefit, providing for cross-border investments, trade and free movement of factors of production across national frontiers. The regional integration agenda of SADAC is premised on the realization of the vision of a common future, a future in a regional community that will ensure economic well-being, improvement of standards of living and the quality of life, freedom of social justice and peace and security for the peoples of Southern Africa. This shared vision is anchored on the common values and principles and the historical and cultural affinities that exists between the peoples of Southern Africa. It is comprised of uh, 16 uh, member states, namely Angola, Botswana, Comoros, that is the current SADC, Democratic Republic of Congo, Iswatin, Lesotho, Madagascar, Malawi, Mauritius, Mozambique, Namibia, <coughs> Seychelles, South Africa, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Your Excellency, SADC has been successful on many fronts and across a wide range of regions. I think this will be explained in details, but just to mention that uh, as we speak, we have more than 33 protocols which have been signed by member states, and these have been translated in policy and uh, demonstrated by our member states. As I conclude, let me once again thank His Excellency uh, Benjamin William Mkapa, the former president of the United Republic of Tanzania, for gracing this event. Allow me also to thank, once again, the University of Dar es Salaam and Ngozi Institute for working with the SADAC Secretariat to ensure, I believe, 
the success of this event, I believe, is going to be successful. It is my belief that given the scale and scope of our global dynamics, it is important that SADAC re-energizes re its momentum for cooperation and integration, and you can do so if indeed you know what is SADAC all about, in order to claim its position in a very competitive, insecure position in a very competitive, insecure, and unequal world that we find ourselves in today. I have no doubt that with deeper integration, SADAC will take advantage of the many opportunities that the region offers to enable us to reap the benefits of regional integration and achieve sustainable economic prosperity for our people whom we serve. May I therefore call upon all regional stakeholders to, rededic to rededicate their, our efforts to SADAC and to the ideals of our founding fathers. Together, we can facilitate SADAC's integration, unity, and shared values for the prosperity and lasting peace for all. With these introductory remarks, I wish uh, the public lecture successful deliberations during the course of the day. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tax. Uh, the next speaker uh, is no stranger to this campus, uh, having taught law at our School of Law for many years before he moved to town, <laughs> hopefully temporarily. And this is uh, none other than uh, the Honorable Dr. Harrison Mwakembe, Member of Parliament, Minister for Information, Culture, Arts, and Sports, uh, to also say a word of welcome, but also more importantly, welcome our keynote speaker, uh, former president. Welcome, Minister Makembe. Your Excellency Benjamin William Kappa, former President of the United Republic of Tanzania and the Chancellor of the University of Dodoma, Right Honorable Natumbo Nandi Ndaitwa, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for International Relations and the Cooperation of the Republic of Namibia, our host, Professor William Wande Lazaro Nangisi, Vice Chancellor, University of Dar es Salaam. Your Excellency Dr. Segomana Lawrence Tax, SAD Executive Secretary, Professor Joseph Zemboja, CEO of Wongoz Institute, Honorable Ministers and Deputy Ministers from SADC member states, Your Excellencies Ambassadors and members of the Diplomatic Corps present here, Professor Rekaza Mukandara, our moderator today, former Prime Minister of the United Republic of Tanzania, Justice Wariyoba, University of the Islam, Council Chair, Justice Rubuva, System Secretary General, Dr. Bashir Wali. I also acknowledge the presence of Zebutiku uh, of the Nyerere Foundation and former Chief Secretary Ambassador Sifwe, and all invited guests, academic staff and students of the University of Dar es Salaam. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Habariza Subuhi. Allow me at the outset to convey sincere apologies from Honorable Professor Palamagamba John Aidan Mwaloko Kabudi, Minister of Foreign Affairs and East African Cooperation, and the Chair of the SADC Council of Ministers, who was initially expected to be here with you and give these welcome remarks, but due to the ongoing SADC summit obligations, he couldn't make it here. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me therefore take this opportunity on his behalf to thank all of you for attending this lecture. I'm incredibly grateful to our keynote speaker, His Excellency Mkapa, and the three discussants we have this morning for accepting our invitation to share with us their informed views on the subject before us. 
Allow me as well to commend the team that has made it happen. I wish in particular to recognize the SADC Secretariat and the Wongos Institute under the office of the President, and of course the University of Dar es Salaam for being generous enough to host us for this important event. In retrospect, however, this particular university is indeed a proper setting for this public lecture, for the noble role it played during the struggle for Africa's liberation from colonial oppression. It is here at the hill, Mlimani, where it was customary to reflect on the struggle for freedom in Africa and the sacrifices made by Africans to rid the continent of colonial exploitation, colonial repression, and racial segregation. It was a marker for revolutionary intellectuals and freedom fighters who would frequent the hill to revitalize, reinvigorate their revolutionary zeal for Africa's freedom through intellectual discourses. The first Pan-African Congress that took place at these universities in Krumah Hall in 1974 added impetus to the liberation struggle spearheaded by the frontline states, the forerunners of today's SADC. To date, this university remains a place where critical discussions on the trajectory of a development are held and strategies drawn. It is rewarding to note that even after so many years, SADC member states can still gather here at the hill to once again revitalize the invigorate the revolution zeal for Africa's this time economic freedom. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it has become customary for host countries of SADC heads of state and government meetings to hold public lectures alongside the summits. The main aim is to promote involvement of the public in matters of regional integration by providing the public with a platform for discussion and comparing notes. Hence, become part of the process towards addressing issues related to SADC regional integration. Through this avenue, Tanzania and the other SADC member states hope to hear from different groups of players, stakeholders on SADC objectives, our performance, and the brainstorm on possible strategies which may take, up, take us a step further. The theme for the SADC public, uh, public lecture is displayed here in bold letters. It speaks for itself. It is therefore upon all of us today to take time and deeply reflect on these issues and share our thoughts. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as you are all aware, during this 39th SADC Summit, Tanzania will assume chairmanship of this regional body for a period of one year. The last time Tanzania assumed this role was 16 years ago, when SADC had been in existence, I think, for only 11 years. The picture today is markedly different. Significant milestones have been reached within SADC in the areas of peace and security, economic cooperation, as well as on the social aspects of uh, regional integration. SADC member states are increasingly coordinating the industrial and the commercial development plans, including freer movement of goods, capital, and people. Politically, Consultations on issues of peace and security have intensified at all levels, indicating greater solidarity and cooperation in key areas of our integration. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Tanzania as Chair of SADC will be tasked to continue the path towards realizing goals set forth by our founding fathers, which is to have a shared future, a future within a regional community. Tanzania will therefore build on the gains already realized thus far. The focus will be on three main aspects, namely creating a conducive environment for industrial growth and expansion across the region, taking collective measures to promote intra-regional trade and creating more opportunities for our youth across the region. These aspects are key to the attainment of sustainable and equitable economic growth and socioeconomic development of our, of our countries. 
Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's high time now that I welcomed our key speaker today. I'm honored and humbled to introduce, uh, well, I think introduce is a misnomer here because President Mkapa uh, needs no introduction in the Sandic region. He has been for a long time a household name in the region. So let me say a word or two on his rich profile for the benefit of the young audience here. His Excellency Benjamin William Mkapa, former president of the United Republic of Tanzania and the current chancellor of the University of Dodoma, began his career as a local administrator in the mid-1960s. In the 1970s, he went on to serve as Mwali Munyerere's press secretary, quite an awesome assignment, later ambassador, then minister for information and broadcasting, and minister for foreign affairs before he became the third phase president of the United Republic of Tanzania in 1995. He was president of the United Republic of Tanzania uh, from 95 to 2005 during the years when our SADC community was growing and redefining itself after the fall of the apartheid regime in South Africa. In 2003 and 2004, former President Mkapa chaired SADC. That was the first time, as I said, Tanzania assumed SADC chairmanship 16 years ago. He started off by launching the Regional Indicative Strategic Development Plan, RISDP, in August 2003 in Arusha, which is a blueprint for economic development in the region. The revised RISDP is still being implemented and serves as a guiding tool towards realization of our regional goals and objectives. Further to that, during his chairmanship, he saw to it that development of the strategic indicative plan for the organ on politics, defense, and security, CIPO, was completed and the plan launched. He then moved on to push for the construction of the SADC headquarters. SADC no longer has business with rented premises today. As chair of SADC, President Mkapa was actively involved in finding solutions to conflicts that ensued in the region during that time and beyond. It is therefore without doubt that former President Mkapa is best placed to take us through this debate and set the tone for the ensuing discussion. I'm therefore humbled and honored to invite His Excellency Benjamin William Kappa, former president of the United Republic of Tanzania, to address this SADC Summit public lecture audience. Mzewe to Kalibusan. Please be seated, please be seated. Honorable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of International Relations of Namibia, Mr. Vice Chancellor of the University of Dar es Salaam, the Executive Secretary of SADC, Minister for Information, Culture and Sports of Tanzania, distinguished people on the, on the pulpit here, Invitees, members of the Diplomatic Corps, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank Honorable Professor Minister of um, Foreign Affairs and East African Cooperation and Chair of the Saudi Council of Ministers for his invitation to me 
to address this meeting. The accolades heaped upon me, as you have heard this morning, are overwhelming. And I find it very difficult to identify myself with those appellations. <laughs> and the traffic itself is, very, is a very engaging one. And I was very hesitant to agree to speak. But Professor Semboja is a very persistent man. And he managed to persuade me to say a few words. Now I am more encouraged to say a few words after seeing the panel of discussants on the high table, but also the eminent persons who are attending this session, led by former Deputy Prime Minister and first vice, former Deputy Vice, vice President, Judge, standing, a long-standing private secretary to President Nyerere, and now executive director of the Nyerere Institute, but especially Dr. Bashir Wali, who really is helping to lead this country to greater prosperity. I want to commend the Ongoz Institute, the SADC Secretariat, and the University of Dar es Salaam for organizing this event. For I believe the Southern African Development Community can contribute to developing a model for Africa on how to build and strengthen regional integration and cooperation as a vital building block for the realization of the African Economic Community envisaged in the Africa Agenda 2063. In order to put our conversation in perspective, it is best to start by reminding ourselves of the mission and the vision of SADC. The mission statement is to promote sustainable and equitable economic growth and social economic development through efficient, productive systems, deeper and deeper cooperation and integration, good governance and durable peace and security, so that the region emerges as a competitive and effective player in international relations and the world economy. The SADC vision envisages the building of region in which there will be a high degree of harmonization and nationalization, rationalization, to enable the pooling of resources to achieve collective self-reliance in order to improve the living standards of the people of the region. The vision of SADC is one of a common future, a future within a regional community that will ensure economic well-being, improvement of the standards of living and quality of life, freedom and social justice, and peace and security for the people of Southern Africa. I have been in retirement for close to 14 years now. So I am not very knowledgeable about developments in SADC since I left office. But I can state proudly and very boldly that in terms of peace and stability, the region has done very well. <clears throat> Where together have emerged national crises, SADC leaders together, explicitly or implicitly, have hastened to come up with and offer counsel and urged restoration of constitutional and political reconciliation. I am thinking of the Kingdom of Lesotho in the 1980s 
and of Madagascar and the Comoros in the new century. We can state unequivocally that of the regional groupings in Africa, the SADC is the most stable and peaceful regionally and also nationally. <clears throat> on the economic front, SADC has agreed on projects and programs for transformation. This has led to adoption of a regional indicative strategic development, a regional infrastructure master plan for all infrastructure projects, a renewable energy and energy efficiency strategy and action plan, and an industrialization strategy and roadmap. But these are mainly blueprints and objectives calling for implementation, which in turn highlights the deficiency in resource and the delinquency in resolve. There is the English adage, if wishes were horses, everyone would ride. We have heard a lot of wishes and lots of programs, but very few can really say they are riding those programs. But the more knowledgeable of the panel will be able to illustrate on the failure that I have in knowing what is going on. Ladies and gentlemen, I will not be the first person to admit that the challenges facing our countries and region are many and daunting. They include poorly integrated markets, widespread poverty, low levels of productivity, outdated or inefficient technologies, and insufficient infrastructure development. These constitute only a part of the obstacles we have to overcome. It is also true that our state of development, characterized by small and medium-sized enterprises, weakly linked to intra- and extra-regional markets, do not make for better opportunities for growth, employment, and poverty reduction. These constraints confront governments and support institutions that have to make fundamental changes in policies, strategies, workforce skills, and organizational linkages to respond to rapidly changing global dynamics. Consequently, support institutions such as SADEC, universities, learning and training centers, as well as civil societies, are today challenged to redesign the in-house competencies if they are to remain relevant and credible to their development mission and objectives. In addition, against this backdrop, the regional landscape makes for a very fluid operating environment. Efforts toward deeper integration, notably toward forming a customs union and emerging international trade and development relationships are increasingly introducing intricate dynamics that continuously challenge intra-regional relationships. We must therefore continue working harder and remain ever watchful. However, there is hope. Our mutual experience should provide vital lessons for SADC itself, for the region, and for Africa. Our solidarity during the political liberation can serve as a strong anchor of economic transformation. Let me reiterate that as a region, SADC has a lot of successes to be proud about. We must not shy away from celebrating our collective achievements inspired by our common history. The remarkable foundation of our identity is in itself a testament to the common struggles of our past. It also speaks to the relentless commitment of our leaders 
toward a shared future of peace, security, and prosperity for our region and the people. It therefore should not come as a surprise that within SADC there would be such strong and political common sense for social and economic integration. I draw a distinction between cooperation and integration. The cooperation that, that occurred during the independence struggle in the form of the frontline states and subsequently the Southern African Development Cooperation Council was led by leaders. They transmitted the cause of that liberation to their people. And that's why throughout the struggle, whether it was by agitation or by armed struggle, we had the people along with us. That is a challenge that needs to be replicated in the present circumstances seeking economic liberation. Our destiny and pride must not be driven by history alone. For the small size of our individual economies demands that we stand better opportunities to fulfilling our aspirations by exploiting the synergies amongst us. As we look into the future, our combined strength is a leverage we can only underutilize at our own disadvantage and peril. With a few exceptions, there is no single area that SADC and the region can rightfully boast about than peace and security it has been able to, rend, to render to our people. As a result, the region has made great strides in raising life expectancy in our countries through robust health intervention and strategies. But that said, much more needs to be done to broaden the scope of the peace dividends in social and economic terms that our people expect and deserve. Ladies and gentlemen, a segment of our bitter history was a clear illustration of how much conflicts caused social and economic dislocations and diminished the productive capacities of economies and of the people. Without doubt, the consolidation of peace and security has invigorated the region's capabilities to tackle the underlying causes of our underdevelopment. Our underdevelopment in education, in science, in technology, in trade, in agriculture, in industrial development and investments. Not surprisingly, SADC people expect a community that is robust, relevant, and effective. Regrettably, the conventional response to the expanding hopes of our people has often been to call for more and stronger policy and legal frameworks to address perceived gaps. While these approaches are useful and indeed necessary, what matters most are concrete outcomes that people and countries can relate to and identify as tangible benefits stemming from the collectivity of our efforts. The transition towards this future, towards sustainable and inclusive economic growth and development, will necessitate changes. These will not only be limited to the manner we do business as a community and as a region. They must embrace a range of policy aspects that impact and spurs innovation, technology, growth, production, and trade. Ladies and gentlemen, at some point, all of us had, have had to make a choice. When the forces of globalization were whirling around, our countries had to decide. We either had to embrace integration to withstand the new dynamics that challenge the very existence of our fragmented, fragile, and vulnerable economic structures or risk being marginalized. We chose to strengthen our unity and to make consequential changes. Today, we are at another crossroads that compounds our challenges. The late Andrew Grove 
co-founder of the Intel Corporation, in his book entitled, Only the Paranoid Survive, cautioning against laxity, stated, and I quote him, we live in an age in which the pace of technological change is pulsating ever faster, causing waves that spread outward toward all industries. This increased rate of change will have an impact on you, no matter what you do for a living. It will bring new competition from new ways of doing things, from corners that you don't expect, end of quote. Unfortunately, this rapid pace of global economic change is also intensifying inequalities within and among countries. We therefore cannot escape ensuring that our, our strategies for sustained growth also ensure an industrialization approach offering tangible economic benefits to the citizens of our region. So, as SADC seeks to deepen its integration, we cannot afford delaying incorporating practical solutions to the productivity challenges we face. At a time of rapidly changing global economic scenarios, such delays or inability only undermines the development potential of our productive capacities in industries, manufacturing and trade, and thus widening the income inequalities among our people and communities. Ladies and gentlemen, the advantages of regional efforts in contrast to solo national efforts are numerous and would, would help overcome several of the current limitations we encounter. As I have indicated, SADC's economic relations have been bolstered by a number of legal frameworks. These can spur and facilitate trade and investments across the region in different sectors, in goods, services, industry, and finance, among others. The SADC vision looks towards a common future in the midst of a rise of anti-trade and protectionist sentiments around the world, remember, America first, in the midst of a rise of anti-trade and protectionist sentiments around the world, it would serve us well not to lose sight of our pursuit toward collective destiny in the Southern African region. We are endowed with vast natural resources that offer vast potential for unleashing growth and development for our region. We must distinguish ourselves through learning and adopting new and innovative strategies that truly add value and bring tangible benefit to our people and countries. For the people and the countries must remain our primary stakeholders to whom we are solely responsible. In this regard, the, the, the SADC industrialization strategy and roadmap as operationally sequenced through the Indicative Strategic Development Plan lays a firm, a firm foundation for industrialization as a framework for the region's integration. Quite properly, its programmatic focus seeks to promote industrial development for poverty eradication. The success of its central mission will rest on the extent that it promotes and accelerates inclusive and sustainable industrial development in keeping with goal nine of the Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. SDG nine calls on, all, on us to, quote, build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation, unquote. In reality, the relevance of this goal transcends all the other SDGs. These endeavors must rest on strengthening industry partnerships across the region to encourage innovation and their competitiveness. The envisioned public-private partnership can only help our manufacturers, including nascent ones, to address familiar hurdles such as costs access to finance and technology. The single largest opportunity for SADC 
is its geography and its population. It offers a huge market and a ready consumer base. Combating poverty initiatives will unleash enormous potential for further growth, prosperity, and stability in the region. Given the challenges facing the region, it is imperative to work even harder and strive even with greater tenacity, greater creativity, and effectiveness towards a common identity and a common resolve to implement agreed common objectives. The region's productivity must increase in industry, in manufacturing, and in labor, especially in the agro-industry and processing sectors. We must seek smart partnerships in these sectors. With the right policies and incentives, we can establish our countries as an attractive destination for win-win investment alliances. Opening new horizons for business and growth cannot be confined to the exploitation of new technologies alone. In my view, it will immensely help if industry partners were to be supported in establishing a network of shared facilities to augment the pursuit of innovation. This could even include established businesses opening up some segments of their production facilities to startups, such as in testing the latter's product quality so as to reduce their costs and enhance their entry into new markets. Ladies and gentlemen, we are a burgeoning population in SADC, the majority of whom are youth. We have to harness their potential in an age dominated by digital, digital technologies. We must build capabilities that grant us insights into the employability of our young people. Consequently, our education systems must be designed to offer the kind of skills that will not only allow them to survive, but to thrive. Governments, organizations, businesses, as well as civil society groups are just as much equal partners in empowering our youth with skills that will enable them to exploit opportunities offered by the digital economy. Left unresolved, this is a real threat to the attainment of the region's aspirations and goals. Such transformational empowerment will not happen spontaneously. Currently, you have governments that, that point to the private sector to generate the necessary jobs. On its part, the private sector appeals to government to establish the primary policy and legal framework to enable it to create the required jobs. Needless to say, at the center of this discourse lie important questions. What kind of jobs do we need for our youths? And who bears the obligation to create them? And how? Surely these are societal challenges which all of us, government and the private sector, must strive in partnership to address. Like most of you here who see how new technologies have affected all our lives, I believe the solution is also in developing appropriate digital tools that are relevant to our daily lives. These are the skills we need to instill in our youths to render them not only employable, but also useful in solving daily productivity problems. Furthermore, this will grant us the resilience to become more adaptive to the learned experience of our youths as they assist in developing the practical tools for mitigating unemployment and unproductivity. The prosperity of our region of our people, and did our future, to a large extent, rests on our ability to address this challenge purposefully. Ladies and gentlemen, with time, circumstances change. This can have a profound impact on an organization or a business. And as circumstances change, so must our ways of doing business. The conversation must change between the government, business community, and the private sector. 
As global corporations transform their business models, so must all of us. And for us, no country can undertake these challenges on its own. We would be better off being ahead of the curve, particularly in industries and manufacturing sectors, where we have the greatest interest. Digital linkages are increasingly disrupting the production and distribution chains for our numerous products. A few years back, the idea of a global car or taxi service with no car, that is Uber today, would have been preposterous. The mushrooming of air bed and breakfast in our cities and countryside that are challenging our revenue authorities would have been fiction during my time in office. <laughs> Retail services by entities that link millions of customers on the click of your cell phone or computer, like the Amazon and Alibaba, have become significant game changers. Clearly, these advances can be harnessed to aid and expand opportunities for our producers, including farmers in rural areas. These advances present both threats, but also windows of hope. It is in this regard we have to be prepared to protect our national and regional infrastructures and capabilities. In their totality, such disruptive forces have a remarkable impact on our, all aspects of our lives. They will affect our means of production, affect our distribution and consumption, they bear considerable pressure on our enterprises as they strive to maintain sustainability, growth, and providing jobs and economic expansion. Our policies and efforts must seek to create an effective framework that cushions our producers for the purpose of promoting their productivity and competitiveness in this environment. This will require support within countries, in the region, and from our development partners. As a result, to be effective and relevant, our regional integration strategies, strategies, whether in agriculture, industry, commerce, health, etc., need to encompass strategies that will not only integrate regional markets, but also improve the competitiveness of the product suppliers. Today, a Tanzanian cash nut product producer lacks the potential that could be unleashed by improved technological inputs to the value chain and an access to digital platforms that opens a wider national or regional market. Our agro-industrial sector, which employs most of our people across the region, is especially vulnerable to current global forces of change. To be sure, there are numerous benefits that these technological forces have allowed all of us to access, especially in the financing sector. Access to finance and related services is today more readily available to our people in remote rural areas without the need for brick and mortal financial intermediaries. This has enormously proven to be of beneficial consequence. This is the wave to be ridden by all our productive sectors for expansion and wider outreach. Many have rightly noted that SADEC's integration, as well as that of the continent, is no longer a matter of choice. Against the backdrop of changing global production structures and distribution systems, in the face of developed states' economic nationalism, remember Brexit, the compulsion for adaptation and evolution is obviously long a past due. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe two major obstacles now stand on the way to integration. The first is the availability of resources for investment and project implementation. Development partners have been helpful, but we tend to depend too much on them. One of my, my, my best recollection when I was head of state and member of the summit of this SADC was the frequency with which at our meetings we are told that all our efforts to reach out to developed or developing countries to help us build our headquarters had been futile. No one was prepared to offer. At the summit 
in Mauritius. I think Ambassador Sifue will testify to this. I said to my colleagues, I said, listen, we must show that we, this, we want to build a real institution which will be ours. And it will not take very much money to even lay the foundation stone. So I said, although we have procedures by which to get authority from parliament to get money to contribute to international organizations, I can promise you that here and now, we are going to present, was it half a million, two million? I think it was half a million anyway. As a token that we can, we, we ourselves are starting on self, self-reliance. I was followed thereupon by Mr. Robert Mugabe from Zimbabwe, and then our host, who was, was Mauritius, had to say, well, we have parliamentary procedures, but we also pro promised to, <laughs> to give another half million. So my happy memory is that a year later in Botswana, all of us took part in laying the foundation stone for the headquarters in which Dr. Katsuma first place. As I said, development partners have been helpful, but we tend to depend too much on them. We must proactively drop the bucket where we are. Governments can raise more revenue for development by strict collection of taxes, by pursuing tax evaders, and by pursuing corrupt people engaged in illicit money transfers across borders and across continents. Additionally, National financial institutions, such as pension funds, should be encouraged to partner across borders. Not enough attention is given to these prospectors. The second obstacle is ignorance about the mission and about the organization itself. There is little knowledge by ordinary citizens about the impact of the SADC mission and vision upon their lives. I notice there are so many mouths closed while the anthem of the Sadek was being played by there. <laughs> Let me hasten to say my own also was closed. <laughs> As I said, uh, too, too, too little is known about the mission and, and, and vision. Like the OAU, it is perceived as being owned by the political elites and the national bureaucrats who hold annual talk shops. More effort needs to explain the goings on in the SADC and to elicit the people's sense of ownership of this regional organization. I want to conclude by noting that as we face these challenges, we must resist the, resist the temptation to build walls and not bridges. The adage that good fences make good neighbors is antithetical to the common destiny and common route we have chosen for ourselves. Unfortunately, over the recent years, the reemergence of nationalism seemed to be a global force we have to contend with. In spite of shared dynamics and integration, finished by globalization. The throes of protectionism, isolationism, and xenophobia are still with us, sadly, even within the region. We cannot resign to these regressive forces. It would only be counterproductive to the vision and the mission of SADC. Nationalism does not emerge by itself, but has to be promoted. It has its drivers in disparities and lack of opportunities. To thrive, it requires media, political, social, economic, and cultural advocacy. These same actors can make a difference to censor and suppress it or to promote it. But it is only by turning around and improving the social economic fortunes of the people that we can make a real difference. The lesson for our countries and the SADC is that our diversities and fragilities will only be exacerbated by the small size and weaknesses of our markets. What we need is to tear down our walls. Our strength lies in unity. And the choice is ours to make. Thank you for your attention.
Yes, another round of applause for a brilliant lecture. Thank you very much, uh, former President uh, Mkapa. Uh, we now move to our next stage of our conversation today, and uh, I'm going to call upon the distinguished members of the high table, uh, with the exception of uh, President uh, Mkapa uh, and uh, the Right Honorable Deputy Prime Minister to remain, but uh, I request the kind of the rest to come down and to the front seat here, uh, in the front row. And then I will uh, call upon the panelists, our panelists to come, please come forward and join the former Prime Minister. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are now uh, fortunate to have uh, three distinguished uh, colleagues who are going to help us further discuss and think about the topic that has been very ably introduced by His Excellency President Mkapa. Uh, first one uh, is uh, his Excellency Dr. Simba Makoni, who is the former Executive Secretary of SADC. If you will please stand so they can. They can. <laughs> His Excellency Dr. Simba Makoni is the former Executive Secretary of, the, of SADC and he served in this post for 10 years. He has also served in various key positions in the government of Zimbabwe. He was appointed as Deputy Minister of Agriculture at Zimbabwe's independence in 1980, when he was only 30 years old. In 1981, he was moved to the position of Minister of, of Industry and Energy, and Energy Development. He also served as Minister of Finance and Economic Development from 2000 to 2002. Uh, His Excellency Makoni has a, a, a Bachelor of Science degree from Leeds University and a PhD from Leeds, uh, from Leicester uh, Polytechnic in medicinal chemistry. Uh, the, f uh, the following uh, uh, speaker is Mr. Gilead Terry, who is the program lead on the investment climate, on the investment climate at the World Bank Group. If you'll stand up. Mr. Ted is currently leading the Tanzanian Investment Climate Program with the World Bank Group. He has also served in various key positions, which include the Director of Policy, Research, and Strategic Communications with the Tanzania Private Sector Foundation. Also served as Program Manager for Policy and Budget Analysis Coordination with the Agriculture Non-State Actors Forum, as well as the Business Analyst for Rural Livelihood Development Program he holds a master's degree in development economics and international development from the University of Edinburgh and a bachelor's degree in political science and economics from the University of Dodoma. Uh, on the other side of uh, His Excellency Mkapa is Professor Anton van Newark. And is a security studies coordinator at Witts School of Governance in South Africa. The professor holds a master's, degree, a master's of Arts degree in political science from the University of Johannesburg and a PhD in international relations from Witts University also in Johannesburg. He's currently based at the Institute of Global Dialogue and the Witts School of Governance 
governance, where he leads the school as academic director, as well as the Center for Defense and Security Management. He has published widely on African foreign and security policy, uh, and he has so many of these publications, which I don't have to go to. And he joins us here to participate uh, in this forum. So, uh, in this part of the uh, of the session, we are going to have two two uh, two parts. One, I'm going to pose some uh, lead questions to our panelists, uh, who will then uh, respond uh, briefly. Uh, and then after with that, we, 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 we do that, then we'll turn to the audience and we'll open the conversation uh, to you members uh, of the audience. And so I'm going to start uh, with uh, His Excellency, uh, uh, former President William Mukapa, which in your key note presentation, you have emphasized uh, the point that member states are key instruments of building and taking the lead uh, in building in, uh, integration just as uh, they did during the what you called the cooperation phase uh, when we were fighting for independence in the region. So what do you see as a strategic role that member states can play in achieving these objectives of deeper integration uh, but at the same time also maximizing networks, uh, maximizing and taking advantage of new technologies, addressing the issues of the youth as you very well uh, uh, put it out in your address just a short while ago. And, and, and what I know you've, you, you, you mentioned challenges, the challenges of finance, of investment rather, and uh, the challenge of ignorance. Uh, so I was wondering whether there are, you think there are any uh, any other issues apart from these two, and also uh, are these things different now from when you were uh, head of state of Tanzania uh, at that time? Please, Mr. President. I have a little more to add. You see, the liberation struggle was a simple agenda. And it, it was embraced by all the leaders very passionately indeed. It's difficult to translate that passion into attachment to the economic cause. Uh, the perception that there is a common enemy facing us is very different now than it was at the time. Mm. So the challenge now is how to conscientize ourselves that we are still under oppression. We are still under oppression. Because even the natural resource base of our country is still owned, practically that is, by our former colonizers and new nations which we've got to know. But if we were to understand that this is the key to the success in the future, the ownership of those resource base and their translation into transformative factors for, of, of, our, of our people's lives and that I hope would bring, would bring our countries together, not as fervently as it was during the liberation struggle, but much more than it is manifest now. Uh, at the national level, there are certain achievements can be perceived as, as applying to all the members of the SADC about the role of the youth, the role of the women, and so on. To, 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 to resolve, to put aside resources on an annual basis after agreeing on a program 
on those issues is the challenge. And for that, you need leadership from the top. Just as getting contributions in order to enable the liberation movements to fight, similarly now, we must educate our people about this new fight and mobilize the resource base. Even if it's a token allocation on an annual basis to promoting the programs and translating them into projects rather than programs. That is the challenge that I see just now, in, in my view. But, you know, I've been out of office for 14 years, so. So although I am retired, I'm not all that tired. I read and I follow things. I think that is really the key. We want, we want a, a real passionate recognition of, of the designs of the developed countries to own or to own our resource, resource base, to, to turn our markets into their markets, um, and to resist the effort of establishing our own markets and our own base, and to recognize that that base is strengthened by integration, not just cooperation. That, I think, is the challenge. What would I have done? Please. I am 14 years older than I was at that time. <laughs> uh, I am very, I am particularly keen about the youth, not so much the women. The women are dependable because they understand what oppression is about. But the, 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 the youth have not lived through the liberation struggle. They have not received enough uh, indoctrination, if you like, of the present, <laughs> of the present situation. And those must be very readily addressed, very readily addressed, so that they can really carry the baton forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Excellency uh, Dr. Simba Makoni, uh, as former Executive Secretary of SADC for 10 years, uh, what would you identify as your successes during that time? And what would you uh, share with the audience? And President Mukapa touched on this theme quite strongly in his presentation. In 1988, we used to offer themes of our work every one or two years. In 1988, we launched the theme of investment in production. And the focus was to work to establish productive capacities in our economies. 